Hi, I'm Melanie Ann Phillips, co-creator of the Dramatica Theory of Story. And in this episode of Beyond Dramatica, we're going to explore a concept called the dramatic circuit that drives the mechanism of story, and also when seen as a psychological circuit, drives the processes of our own minds. Okay, what is this dramatic circuit? Well, first of all, if you look at the Dramatica chart, which describes all of the elements that are in story structure when they're at rest, before there's dramatic potential. You can see here on the chart that it's divided into four primary areas. Universe, physics, mind, and psychology. Universe are the external situations that we face. Physics, the external processes. Mind, our internal state of mind. And psychology, our internal processes, our manners of thinking. Because when you think about it, anything that you can look at and observe in the world, anything you can learn something about, is either going to be external, which is represented by these two, or internal, which is represented by these. And it's either going to be a state, like universe or mind, or it's going to be a process, like physics and psychology. Basically, if you want to understand how anything works, the easiest and most accurate way to begin dividing in smaller pieces so you can get a better grip of it is to divide it into internal or external states and processes and find out where is the part that you're interested in exploring. Now, all four of these together create what we call a quad. In Dramatica, everything is based on fours. For example, if you look into the outside universe, you're going to see that you have mass and energy and space and time, the four dimensions of our universe. If you look inside in the mind, you're going to find the four dimensions of mind, knowledge, thought, ability, and desire. Knowledge is the mass of the mind. Thought is the energy of the mind. Ability is space of the mind, and desire is the time of the mind. Why so? Well, just as with the universe, when you have mass, you have energy, it's a substance, it's an object, it's something you move around. You can take bits of knowledge and combine them into things. You can break them into smaller particles until you get down to the elements of knowledge, as it were. Thought is like energy. Thought is the force that rearranges knowledge. And just as you have relativistic relationships, where mass can be transformed into energy and energy into mass, similarly, you can transform knowledge into thought and thought can become new knowledge. And just as with mass and energy, a small amount of knowledge can generate an awful lot of thought, but it takes a whole lot of thought to create one true piece of real knowledge. Similarly, space deals with the area between things that are massive. Where mass is not is space. Mass is in space, but it warps space. Not going to get into the details of the physics of it here, but in the mind, the same thing happens. It's between what you know and what you don't know. You take two items that you know, and you see where they fall in the realm of observation, and you can look at all the area in between, which is what you don't know, and that defines space. So just as you have um, universe and physics, just as you have mass and space, so too do you have knowledge and, um, and uh, ability, which is the relationship between what you know to what you don't know, and therefore it creates a sense or a way of measuring your ability. And desire is time. Why is desire time? Because it's always looking at what was to what is and comparing it to what might be and seeing how long it takes to get from one of those to the next and also whether things are moving more quickly or more slowly towards what you want or what you don't want. And that's how we evaluate. So desire is all about time in the mind. Knowledge, thought, ability, and desire, mass, energy, space, and time. But that's just a flat chart, kind of like a periodic table of story elements. And if you take that chart and you expand it into three dimensions so that you can see these nested areas, because again, looking at them here, they're actually families within families. Each one is broken up into smaller quads, and each of those quads is broken up even into smaller quads. But if you look at them expanded, you can see that we have large families that are broken up into subfamilies at the second level, and then go down to the next level and the next level when we finally get down to the elements of thought. This basically is a map of how much the mind can consider, both in terms of large perspectives and small perspectives. And if you try to consider anything smaller than this, 
the mind will lose track of being able to simultaneously consider these large perspectives at the same time. If you look at anything bigger, a larger perspective than this, you lose track of the details at the same time. That's what we call the size of mind constant. Now the thing about these quads, what's really interesting, and that's what the subject of this is, we'll have many more talks on the same subject, is just to introduce you to the concept of a dramatic circuit. And what better way to deal with something scientific than to use a trusty Crayola marker? Here we can see the nature of a quad. Four items. And in that quad there are a number of interesting relationships. For example, there are relationships that are diagonal, and these are called dynamic relationships. And then there are relationships that are horizontal, and they're companion relationships, and then two relationships that are vertical, which are dependent relationships. In every quad, the four elements of the quad go together in a family, sort of like the noble gases or the rare earths. And these, this family here describes something of the nature of all four elements. Together they fall under that umbrella, but they also end up describing these four independent things that are each a little bit different from the other, like fluorine and chlorine, for example. Now, take that with this three-dimensional chart, and you realize just how many of these elements, how many of these families, and how many of these relationships there are. It has to be done in such a way that any relationship, like uh, uh, using an analogy, if you say, this is to this as this is to this. In other words, at any level that you have, any diagonal relationship is going to be identical to a diagonal relationship even in the smallest areas of any other quad. It's repeating, it's fractal in nature. You can get a sense of that from this. But here's one of the most intriguing things about it, which is the subject of the talk today, the dramatic circuit. This is just an introdu introduction, introduction of the concept. The introduction is that every quad, one of these items is going to be seen as a potential, one is going to be seen as a resistance, probably it would normally fall here at rest. Potential resistance, current down here, and power or outcome up here. Potential, resistance, current, and power. These are the four elements of any circuit. What we have in terms of dramatic circuit is that whatever item here will be the potential that will drive a scene or drive an act or drive a conflict among characters. What will hold that back or mitigate it is the resistance down here. And over here in the current is the kind of energy that comes out of that potential being applied to this resistance generates this kind of energy flow, whether it's an activity or an emotional shift or change. And ultimately, it leads to some new potential or power or outcome, which are just different ways of looking at the same thing, really, in terms of dramatics. Similarly, in psychology, There'll be a potential, a resistance, a current, and a power to every quad of our psychology. And in fact, this is a map of the story mind. This is a map of the items, the elements in the story mind at different levels of our cognition, okay? Both emotional and intellectual. And it's like a Rubik's Cube. You twist it and you turn it and wind it up with dramatic potential that comes from our own individual experience. And then over the course of a story or over the course of a lifetime, this is unwinding. New things are constantly winding it up, and old ones are constantly unwinding or getting stuck in the unwinding process. So the important thing to remember then is that each of those items in that large chart, or each of the items here, it's like object-oriented programming in computers. You look at a process in an object-oriented program as an object, and similarly you can look at a psychological process as an object. For example, we all have fear. What we fear is not a mental process. That's our experience. Having fear is a process. And if you treat it as an object, it becomes one of these items in the quad. It becomes one of these items in the entire structure. Then the dynamics that are at work, the potential, the resistance, the current, and the power that shift and twist and turn these into different conjunctions, like a Rubik's Cube, shows how any particular psychology is wound up. Because every psychological process, then, is this one family in the quad driven by a little psychological circuit or in a story by a little circuit of dramatics. And when you see the way they're nested, then you see that each set of objects makes up one quad, and then four quads together create another set of objects made up of smaller objects or processes made up uh, that become larger processes. And these twist in turn and become in turn part of even larger processes 
ultimately creating all the levels of our cognition, all the levels of our emotion, uh, both in stories and in psychology. That's the introduction. We'll go on to the details of that in future postings.